Okay, sounds uh, good to me. Okay, good. Well, I, I'm having a wonderful uh, chat with pianist Oriel Tsakhor. Yep. Oh, I think I did, did better that, that time. Uh, we're going to be discussing uh, uh, his 2019 MSR Classics release. Brahms in transcription. Now, every conductor out there, including myself, knows how we value transcriptions of symphonies, particularly the Brahms symphonies, uh, the, the, and, and, and some of the Hungarian dances here. But the, let me just read, read the title of the CD again. I kind of got lost in my conversation. 2019 MSR Classics release, Brahms in transcription, symphony and Hungarian dance piano transcriptions by Brahms, very interesting, some of this work, by Rager, Max Rager, the fabulous composer pianist, and uh, I've just forgotten the first name of Mr. Kirchner. Theodore. The Theodore, Th Theodore Kirchner. And the, uh, the Kirchner and the Rager transcriptions are all world premiere recordings. Yeah. And what a service you have provided here. I mean, I just have to say, we're talking uh, uh, movements from all four of the Brahms symphonies. You have selected one mo movement and or, I presume, were, the, were all the symphonies transcribed? At the, and then no. you made a choice or just these movements? Just these movements. It's an interesting uh, thing. Actually, I'll tell you a little anecdote how I came about to find them. Okay. We are talking 1983, 1984. I was at the, doing my DMA uh, at the Ju uh, Julia School of Music, which was started and uh, also about transcription, but within the Brahms Schumann circle of friends and composers. And I was kind of trying to find a niche, what to do with the, with the DMA uh, project itself. Um, and then in 1983, um, the 150th anniversary of, um, of the birth of Brahms, Breitko von der Hartel published the, the world first printing of the scherzo that's also on this disc. Um, so um, so that, when I saw that, of course, it's incredibly difficult, um, but I decided, well, that is something that I really want to explore because obviously it hasn't been recorded, hasn't been played, it's the first printing. Um, and so um, I was traveling, touring in Europe, in the States, um, and the idea came to me, there I transcribed the other three movements for solo piano of the Schumann Quintet, because I read that Brahms wanted to complete the, the, the whole piece, Clara Schumann, who, the, uh, who got the dedication for this uh, transcription, wanted it to be done um, and so I spoke with my advisor at Julia, Dr. Barry Brook, the great musicologist and he said hey Uriel I just bumped into you in Paris uh, uh, last two weeks ago I heard you play a wonderful recital in Sal Gavo in, in, and you played Brahms and Schumann I really liked you Schumann I really loved you Brahms I think you're the guy to do it go for it Nice. And so I transcribed it, and that's another project, and did record the form out that uh, the Skerzo movement of Brahms back then on the Devox label that was released the, in 1996 uh, was the world premiere recording of the Brahms Skerzo um, uh, movement, as well as my movements, but but... But during the preparation of the written, so that's the side story, the kind of the, the background, yeah. um, I looked through the archives. Juliet had those huge catalog books back then of the whole collection of the archives of the New York Public Library next door. So, of course, back then, as we know, no internet, no nothing. So um, I looked at the card catalogs, photocopies, page by page, whatever I could find about Schumann, about Brahms, about anything to do with the Schumann-Brahms circle that might be important material to put in the introductory notes for the transcription of the actual music that I, that I did. And then I saw this card that says five slow movements mm -hmm. from Brahms symphonies by Max Rager. And I said, 
hmm, that looks very interesting. <laughs> it's not the Rager is not exactly um, part of the Bram Schumann circle, so I'll really want to come back to it. So of course I took notes and wrote the call number of the card and said, I'll get back to it. Let me get this DMA going and the transcription and the rec and the whole thing, and I'll come back to it. So I did finish the DMA. I did record for the Divox lab label in Switzerland, both versions with the one with the original one that Schumann wrote with strings, uh, with the Amati string quartet from Zurich and my own version with Brahms's. And then, of course, you know, as I say in the in the liner notes, uh, the I'm always I always was greedy about Brahms. I I worked on all his works. I played most of them. I played a lot concerti, all the chamber music, most of the piano works. I wanted more Brahms. <laughs> I was greedy about Brahms. So then I realized, I think it was 2014. I said. Ah, what about that card with the symphonies of Brahms by Max Reger? I love Brahms. I want more Brahms. I love Reger. We know, musicologically speaking, we know that there are lots of continuation by Reger of what Brahms has done with the harmonic lines, with the counterpoint, with the uh, lush orchestration. Of course, it's even more so with Reger, but there's a lot of here. A lot of Brahms in Rager, and Rager admired Brahms. So I said, okay, let's look for my notes. Of course, I kept all my notes. But oh, you, you scholarly types. It makes, well, makes me so disgusted. Go ahead. <laughs> I am, but I also, I, but of course, I'm not that scholarly, because of course I looked at <laughs> all the notes, and of course I found everything I needed except the call number. So I said, all right, hmm, okay, so it was summer, I was touring back and forth, and I said, okay, let me write to the research department of the, of the New York Public Library, the archives in Lincoln Center, see what they say. So I wrote them, sent an email, and hey, I remember that, that collection, uh, and it could be that it's too fragile for you to copy that, whatever, but in case, can you at least tell me the call number and if in some way or the other it's available? And in the meantime, then I went to Israel to play some concerts and visit family, etc. Came back, um, and then two days after I came back, an email from them. Sure, we have it. Here is the call number. Fabulous. And if you send us 45 bucks on PayPal, we'll send to your computer the score. I said, hey, how easy can that be? <laughs> so it did. Two weeks no, later, and I, of course, I, I sent them the money right away. Two weeks later, it was on my computer. And no moss grows underneath the feet of the New York Public Library. It's like, 45 bucks, please, PayPal. Pay now. We'll send you. <laughs> great. It's wonderful. That's how that's how we do it, you know. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that Listen, great? I don't think I properly introduced you. Can I just take us back a, a face, just so that we know that that you're not talking completely out of the top of your head? I don't. I'm not sure, but but uh, again, uh, Urio Chahor, I'm get, I'm trying. Uh, graduate of Tel Aviv uh, Ruban Academy. I may have already done this Juilliard School. I think we did this. Got your doctorate degree. Yeah. I just want to may, and, and and you headed the piano area at University of Iowa, and you are on faculty at University of Iowa. Just so that we know you're not wandering around in the Midwest making noises like you know what you're doing. Okay. So well, that's a fascinating. I just to claim that I know what I'm doing, but <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you know what you're doing in terms of this CD because, again, uh, it's part of what brought my radar up as a conductor when I saw <gasps> transcriptions, Brahms symphonies, Max Rager. I thought, yeah, I gotta, I've got to look at, check into this. And and th these are, as you have already indicated, very difficult. Difficult, yeah. very authentic to the original. It's amazing um, what Rager did uh, with. As you know, well know, a melodic line by Brahms can go in four different registers by five, six different instruments. And it's amazing how Reagan himself really faithfully tried to really contain 
you know, retain and contain that within the two hands. And there's an interesting take to it that, as we discussed, there are the transcription of the whole symphonies by Otto Zinger, who, for, for example, who, but those are much simplified and really do not contain many of the contrapuntal lines and the, and the layers, uh, the richness of the layers that Brahms has. Uh, and actually, in the research towards this recording, um, I read a lot about the correspondence between Reger and Zimrock, and Zimrock was also, of course, the publisher of, of um, Brahms. Uh, Zimrock was, of course, highly protective of Brahms, and he didn't want anyone to do just about any transcription. So Otto Zinger was not published by, by Zimrock. It was another publisher. But, um, and actually, um, Rega wrote to, to Zimrock and saying, it's really not practical to do the fast movements. They're just to do justice with two hands, which really what I want to do, it's really only those five movements, the, the four official slow movements plus the Poco Allegretto from the third symphony. Yeah. They are the only ones I can do justice to, and though, and they are actually, I think, you, as I say in the booklet, uh, you will love them. I, I do justice to them, and I think you, you will approve. And as you said, what struck me, now I realize what really struck me, is you have just described other transcriptions as being simplified, of course, for yes. sitting down at the piano and thrashing them out. And these are not. <laughs> and I think that must have been what struck my ears immediately. Was just I was hearing everything. It was fabulous. Also love the tempi that you have chosen because you can. You know what I mean? In other words, this is not an orchestral piece. It is, but it's in a piano transcription. So you have a whole lot more wonderful license to follow all that intense, all these those intense harmonies, the voice leading, all that good stuff. It was just so, so that now I understand. Yeah, that that's it. These are these are no nonsense transcriptions. These are not okay. simplified. Yeah. Really but, well, he really adhered to adhered to the whole thing and and really tried to follow not just the harmony or the melodic line, but actual the counterpoint, the voice leading, the switching among registers and 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 pitches. He, and he color, even color, even the kind. If you can yes. imagine orchestral varying orchestral color on the piano, I mean that all by itself is an incredible feat, and you can hear it. He really, uh, speaking of faithful. And by the way, that may be the. Uh, uh, I don't know, the subtext of transcriptions in general. Can people who do transcriptions have a responsibility? Let's talk about Brahms Schumann. There's a responsibility, all right. Give us a little, we're, ta we're talking about the transcription by Brahms of Schumann's piano quintet, the, the scherzo movement. Let's skip around a little bit, but let's, let's, you were there a little bit earlier, I believe, but let's just stay there for a bit. Brahms presented this transcription to Clara and so on. On the 13th of September, her birthday, 1854, in, in, right? Or, yeah. And but, and uh, Schumann was dead in 1855, I think. Yeah. 56. So he was potentially aware of that. He did. He was aware of Clara Schumann's arrangement for four hands of the whole mm. quintet. And um, Brahms also wrote a two piano transcription of the quintet. And when he sent it to Breitkopf for publication, this was lost in the mail and never found. So we lost that. So the only thing that's left from Brahms regarding the quintet is the solo version of the scherzo. You mean they even lost the mail in the 19th century? Shocking. In Germany. <laughs> <laughs> in Germany, yeah, in Germany. How is that possible? Okay. <laughs> Where was the Kaiser when we needed him? Okay, sorry. Uh, but that's very interesting. And also he must have said, eh. I'm not going to go back there. No, you know Brahms, that kind of a person, you know, if, if something, if he didn't have time and he was busy with another project, as as was the case later with the with the Hungarian dancers, and he went on to other projects, that that was him. Um, but um, the transcription of the Schumann is again like the Reger. That's the hallmark of, I believe, of the whole disc. Is very very faithful. I mean, he really follows. I mean, it's it, it's it's another challenge because you have the piano part of the quintet there, and on top of that, 
he weaves the string parts into that. As, and, you know, it's not just that it's hard to play, but it's also hard to imagine how he so successfully was able to to integrate those voices of the strings into already a thick piano part. And it and suits him, it suits Brahms <clears throat> perfectly, I'm thinking. The perfectionist, uh, the classicist, if you will, I know we're not quite in, in that, but just the idea that he took took this the piece, this quintet, and studied it carefully, and then reconceived it perfectly in terms of respect for the original. I mean, he was so respectful of other composers, not just the great ones like his friend Schumann, but also, so to speak, lesser composers, you know, so so he was always very respectful of any musicians that tried to, to write music and to really believe in what he or she believed. I mean, the, the typical, um, the couple for Aaron Sorgerberg, Henrietta and... Uh, so he, he admired both of them, and and they wrote interesting pieces of music, and and he really, you know, at, at the down moments when, when they wrote to him, oh, we are not as great as you, we are not as great as Schumann, we are not the... He, he really encouraged them to continue write music and to, to do the best they can. So he was a very supportive colleague to musicians that he respected. He at time nasty to others, but that's another story. Hey, but that's okay. <laughs> They deserved it, no doubt. Uh, ab about uh, uh, Theodore, Theodore Kirchner's uh, transcriptions, uh, some of, uh, I'm now going to switch a little bit to the Hungarian dances because, you, we, you, tell me, uh, give me a little overview. I think there are three or four of his transcriptions, are there? Three, uh, three on this disc. I mean, there are 11 all together. Yeah. It's interesting that um, I've switched back and forth um, so, of course, the disc contains Brahms' original solo piano transcription of the, of the Hungarian dances, and they have a history, of course, having, having started uh, being uh, forehand, and then some of them were orchestrated, including the first one, the G minor, that's on the disc, and then so piano transcription at the request of, again, Zimbro, the publisher. I mean, because, of course, they were good money makers for both of them, and they were wonderful pieces. But it's interesting that um, Brahms used to play them a lot in concerts. He heard, of course, all those gypsies tunes. Um, Excuse my phone. My uh, clock is going off. Pardon me. Yeah, in Budapest. So he heard them. And Brahms really, from what we read about the story of them, uh, improvised them as he was performing them. So actually, when Zimrock asked him to do the forehand arrangement, it was easier for him because he actually, on some level, simplified each part, so together, two amateur pianists could play them. But then when Zimrock asked him to create the solo versions of them, it was actually very difficult for him because it felt to him like frozen on, on the page and music that he used to basically go on stage and improvise. Amazing. And, and we never think often about these composers as I improvisers in, in live oh, performances. They, Brahms. They, we Beethoven, don't. of course. Mozart, naturally, yeah. But Brahms, it hadn't, it hadn't really occurred to me, although he played taverns and clubs and other places of ill repute, right, as a kid, improvising. And as a concert pianist, he, he traveled in Europe and played his own pieces, but of course, when he played Hungarian stuff or basically gypsy stuff, this was all improvised. So, basically, from what we understand, we have one version of many possibilities. We don't know what the other possibilities, but we have that. But apparently, it was pretty difficult for for him to do because he really couldn't decide out of these free improvisatorial mm -hmm. versions that he had so many of how. Should I put it on, on paper and create one version out of that? So for him, actually, it took a while. So it took him almost three years to do those 10 things, which is atypical of Brahms for short pieces like that. Usually he was quicker in those respects. And what uh, a fascinating story you've just given about the mind 
and his mind is swimming with the 18,000 variations he's done of number seven, I don't know, Hungarian dance, and, he, and his head is like, what, what, how, where, when, where do I pull the notes and put something down forever? What? Must have been uh, really So strange. for me, it, it felt very rigid and, and, and kind of stiff and, you know, so that, I suspect, we don't know that exactly. He basically said to Zimrock, when Zimrock asked him about the other 11 dancers, he said, well, I'm busy with other stuff. Um, but we suspect because they're actually more contrapunctally um, complicated that he really didn't want to deal with that experience again. So he said, why the, don't you give it to somebody else? He didn't specify Kirchner, interestingly. That was Zimrock who approached him. And, but Brahms did know Kirchner. Of course, no. yeah. because Kirchner did with Brahms blessing many other piano transcriptions of, of, of him, yeah? I mean, the main thing is the two piano piece on the theme by Schumann, the variation Opus 23, and that was the request of Brahms. Ah, got it. And, and there were piano trio or uh, transcription of the string sextet that Kirchner did. So many, many things that, and, and many leaders. So, so he knew, and as I said, Brahms hinted at some point that, oh, Kirchner, Theodore, he is, he's my official transcriber, basically. Oh, that's right, you mentioned that. Excellent. Well, while we're down there with the Schumann-Brahms transcription of the, of the piano quintet we just discussed, the, the, the scherzo movement, uh, because Brahms was a classicist, I mean, he's kind of stuck with that. I don't know whether it's really true, but you know what I'm trying to say, that thing. Well, he was not of, as I say in the booklet, not of the, the list you know, f f the, the German future school, but rather the other school in Germany. So therefore his Gluck would be very, very carefully put together. I'm thinking again of the Gavat from, from uh, the opera, oh go, boy, here I go, I'm in trouble now, Ephigene and Aulid. Oh, yeah. That was yeah. horrible. And it, anyway, uh, but this charming little Gavat, but the idea that, that when I, as I listen to it, it ends the, it ends the CD. Yes, it does. And for me, it was just like, ooh, kind of a full circle. Brahms as classicist. Ador Absolutely. Adoring Gluck, the great classical opera composer, if you will, from that period. And we know that actually from the Baroque period, um, of course, Brahms adored Bach, but he was one of the few who really played and collected the full uh, output of Scarlatti. Huh. He had many volumes of Scarlatti in his library. Well, huh. And Gluck is kind of a transitional composer, is he not? He sort of transitions into the classic period. That's what's kind of the yeah. analogy I was trying to make. This great yeah. care and those kind of colors, that kind of classical form, whatever. Yes. Yeah. I mean, again, it's pianistically difficult because it's an ensemble put into two lines or in the middle three lines, actually. The, the, the well-known yeah, the third hand or whatever that the is. The third hand effect, the two thumbs playing some one melody and, and the other fingers around it doing something else. Yeah. Did you suffer any cramps? Me? No. <laughs> Just I'm curious. I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. I think I'm seeing all thumbs at the keyboard and you know. Okay. A little backstory. You're Israeli? Yes. I was actually born in Mumbai. My ah. parents my father was a civil engineer. That was the day job. Um, at night, I don't know to this day, I mean, they're both in a, in a better place, uh, uh, supposedly, but I think, and he could never talk to him, but he was a spy, basically, working for the Israeli Mossad. That makes meals interesting. Probably lots of silence. Yeah, so that's why I say I don't really know for sure. But from what I gathered, uh, they were both my parents' Holocaust survivors. So uh, when my father passed away and my mother passed away, I saw lots of correspondence of underground operations during the Second World War. So I think it was in his blood to be a spy. So that was one of the operations. The family lived there in Mumbai back then, and I was born there in 1958. I was I was just trying to put a, 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 a year there because it would have been after the war, I of presume, course. that those sections <clears throat> of the world were at threat. Yes. Communist uh, overtaking. So in, in other words, Western interests would be very interested in making sure <coughs> things yeah. 
uh, for example, that the empire, that India, India does not fall to uh, to the bad guys, something like that. Exactly. <laughs> so he was exactly what operation I don't know and will never know. But um, his day job was civil engineer. His night, whatever. Wow. So born in Mumbai, <clears throat> then what? Then they, we came. Then actually, I lived in uh, because that was the Shah back then. The family lived in Tehran for a while, and when I was almost three years old, uh, the family came back to Tel Aviv. So I was raised in Israel and uh, went to did my undergraduate at the Tel Aviv Rubin Academy with a great, stunning pianist and teacher, Mindro Katz. And uh, then went to Juilliard to do my to finish my masters to do my masters and do my DNA there. And how was, did anybody pick up on you? You know, did anybody say, "Oh, we've got somebody over here in Israel. Let's bring bring." You know what I mean? Th those stories, or, or did you just say, "Hey, I'm here. Take me. Listen." Well, uh, like any um, like any saturated market, like <laughs> even Israel, if you do well abroad. And I started winning competition. I got the prize of the Queen Elizabeth competition, Buzoni competition, other competitions. Those Start, are big. Started playing a lot in Europe and the United States, and then of course the door were opening more so in in Israel. So, so that's basically how I started my career in the early 80s, in 1983, 1984, winning some awards and starting from there. I did some Beethoven recordings and. Uh, for EMI and then later other labels in, in France and Belgium and that's that's how things really started. Did you emigrate to the um, United States or was it a just a position? I mean, are, are you, did you get well, to the United States? Well, I was in New York and uh, you know, and then when this position came up and you know, I accepted then yeah, the rest is history. Yeah, that's, yeah. All, that's all it takes. I'm I'm serious. <laughs> you know. You know. I mean, obviously, they like my teaching in the interview. They like my playing. So here we are. There you go. And, okay, good. Excellent. I just wanted to ask about that sort of history. People are always curious. And was piano, you know, from childhood, or did you? Well, it's into, interesting. You know, I I started, of course, as a kid, six, seven. I had many interests: uh, electronics, as, as, as you see. we see, vacuum tube electronics that occasionally I build, and. Um, you know, I was actually, uh, high school was very interested in chemistry and physics, so I could have been an engineer, but at some point the music bug hit me when I was 16, 6, 7, and I said, no, I really want to do that. And was and that when your father threatened to disown you? <laughs> he said, well, <laughs> try double major, and then I went to study with Mintu Katz, and, um, who accepted me before the uh, academy, and then... Um, he knew the merchandise, so to speak, and my parents were there, and he said, I will take you under one condition. He knew it. I didn't ask him. No scheme there, no, no nothing. He said, only if you own major in music, nothing else, for three years. Obviously, it's not the first set of parents. That yeah, exactly. It's, okay, do music, but do something real on the side so you can fall on that, just in case. That I will only take you if you only do that, devote you 150% of your time to do that, to dedicate yourself because that's the only way to doing this and succeeding or at least finding out whether you can really do it and whether you really truly love it. And so when my parents, I didn't convince them, I didn't need to, he convinced them. He, exactly he told, right. yeah. They surrendered on the spot. Your, 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 yeah. your father, the spy, just said, okay, you win. <laughs> You know, my mother was also to try that, try that. And she heard that and said, "Okay, if the master says, well, follow that." And by the way, it makes perfect sense. It's a it's a very sensible way. You have to have you have to be involved long enough to decide whether this is really what you're going to do with with your life. So you it's very, even if you're gifted, as you clearly were, to get to Juilliard and so on. Let's. Uh, I'm I'm just going to browse through. How are we doing time wise? I'm going to browse through just a little bit, uh, literally as we speak, because I I put some. I do my famous triple stars after some of these. But basically, one of the questions I was going to ask, because it seems kind of uh, possibly deliberate, is there are Hungarian dances on this CD that are Brahms. Period. Okay? And then there are Hungarian dances of Brahms that are transcribed. 
what's the difference or is that a is that another dumb question in that what as a pianist so you know what can you go Ooh, yeah this is Brahms or you know or what is there any you know what I'm trying to ask it's a, yeah. is there real difference in the feel in the performance between the Kirchner mm -hmm. arrangement and the Brahms arrangement of him of and the music and yeah something like that the conception or because do you sit down and say ah oh, this is Brahms yeah and so then, oh, this is that, because you said there are three dances so so the program here is is an outcome, of course, of many, many live performances yeah. all over the States, all over the world, basically, in Europe, in Israel, in, in, in Hong Kong, in many places. And so obviously the, I did not do everything um, all at the same time. Uh, the fixed thing was the the five movements of reggae, they didn't change. But the Hungarian dances um, by Kirschman did change over time, as far as my selections. Ah. I started with the last two E major, E minor of 2021. And interesting, I, I went to, I believe it was a university somewhere in Illinois. Um, and one of my colleagues said, it's really interesting to compare um, to compare the Brahms and the and the Kirchner, the Kirchner to her sounded much more Schumann-esque. Maybe because thicker or something. Maybe thicker. But the thin, maybe thinner. Oh, thin. Maybe the way he went with the voice leading, the way he changed the. The inversions of the harmony uh, from the original four hands, um, and I said, "Yes, that's that's true because Kirchner, on some level, was much more of a Schumannesque type of a person, and that's an interesting thing to think how Brahms trusted him and liked his his way of transcribing because, on some level." Um, Brahms is more kind of monophonic, homophonic at times, yes. and virtuoso, while it's a little bit simplified, but just to understand how one can view the difference, while uh, Kirchner can be much more contrapuntal, a bit thinner, which makes thing not so thin, but rather transparent. Clearer. Yes, yes, exactly. And yes. on some level, my hunch now, after looking into all that, is that almost Brahms intuitively wanted him to do those dances because Brahms viewed them as much more contrapuntal and more complex to transcribe, hence more work, which he didn't want to do. And or was busy with other projects, and he thought that Kirchner would do a very good job. But it's interesting that some of them do sound more Brahmsian or less Brahmsian. So, for example, the last two, really to my colleague and few others, but she was the most emphatic, uh, to say that it really sounds material of Brahms, but in the style of Schumann. Well, let me try and catch my breath and see if I understood what you have just discoursed because it is fascinating and it also tie, makes some kind of circle. There's something there with Brahms Schumann that is so fascinating. Uh, just and as you you were started, you said something else. But when you said uh, at some level, I thought you're at some level this Schumann. Thing. I mean, he were, that was a very important time in his life with Clara and, and with Robert Schumann. Uh, that's what, I, and I, that, that's. I'm glad you said all of this. It's fascinating to me, but also it helped me, I think, understand what I was hearing and trying to explain. You mentioned very clearly the word homophonic, homophonic, in the, and that is kind of the Brahmsian way, very homophonic. Yeah. Uh, uh, and and not so complex, although of course he. Understood counterpoint and everything. So, but 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 uh, uh, help! I've just forgotten um, uh, the 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 uh, arranger. Help me, please. Uh, 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 Kirchner. Kirchner had mu had much more liberty. 
if you will. Ed Koch, Mark Liberty, but somehow he managed to to adhere completely to Brahms. Absolutely. But so there is, you know, I mean, and also if we consider the first, the, I mean, Kirchner himself wrote quite a few short pieces, original pieces, like close to 1,000. Some of them pedagogical, some of them just character concert character pieces. So virtuoso piano writer, that for sure. He also wrote chamber music, trios, songs, etc. Um, but if one listens to them, they are really closer to Schumann in style than Brahms. And also, he was quite a flamboyant character. He was a gambler. Actually, Brahms had to save him several times with money that he was married then decided to leave and completely leave the family and a lover in Hamburg that he lived with and he was a gambler actually there was I we think we know that for a while he, he had an affair with Clara Schumann after Robin died. Got a so, motorcycle going by. I want to make sure. Sorry about the noise. I want to make sure I got that one right because I'll have to now rush back to the letters <laughs> and have, an, have another read. But ah, because there was there have been all the rumors. But I but I if Kirchner and being a lover of Clara Schumann's had not come into my uh, encyclopedia. Yeah. Thank you. Now I'm really freaking and out. Actually, if if you look at the photos of of Kirchner from certain photos from second certain angles he looks very much like Robert so check it out you know we'll be, the days before television so much more entertaining so many <laughs> so many more details of life and walk long walks and you know, all that well now that really I mean all kidding aside that is a fascinating connection and what, what I'm what I'm thinking as a kind of I don't know, philosopher, musician, if you will, is there's always uh, substance. These stories are dense and complex, and we have just constructed, I'm, I'm not exaggerating, am I? This is a very interesting circle, the Brahms, Kirchner, Clara Schumann, uh, Robert Schumann circle. Yes, and actually, if you think about it, the right composers chose the right repertoire to transcribe. So if you think about what we think, the lover of Clara Schumann, the more Schumann-esque stylistic person transcribing the more gypsy-type music, it's hard to imagine Max Rager doing in a Hungarian dance. Yes? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. It never occurred to me before, but somehow an image popped to my mind. Uh, no, that's <laughs> regular. No, no, <laughs> far too serious. Though, although you know, when you read about Max Reger, you realize what a fantastic sense of humor he had. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Nice. You know, I mean, as the big, the one of his stories that he went, he was a workaholic, of course. And after a while, a friend said, you know, Max, you have to, we have to eat dinner, you know, you have to stop it. And so, of course, Max realizes that he's very hungry. And of course, any, any good steak that he eats uh, needs to be washed with lots of beer. So, <laughs> so, but he goes to the restaurant next to the, where he works. Um, and he says to the, so the waiter, the friend orders what he ordered. And then the waiter asks, well, hey, Rager, what would you like to eat? So he says, um, I, I, I'm very hungry. I would like a two-hour long steak. <laughs> That's hilarious. Beautiful. Beautiful. So he did have a sense of humor, but when it came to music, we know his style. We know the type of music he wrote. Um, so it's hard to imagine that he would do Hungarian dances. On the other hand, it's hard to imagine that Kirchner would do symphonies. So uh, basically, you've just described again. Uh, this CD is much more than the sum of its uh, of its obvious parts. I mean, much, much more. Very fascinating CD. I think we. I think. Uh, what, what have I forgotten to ask you? What What would you like to put out to anybody? You're, you're I think. How I came to be uh, to to know those pieces, it's an important thing, and I told you about that. Yeah. So, and so, and the character of the 
players there, and so I think we covered a lot of yeah, territory. I think we, I think we did, and, and uh, so let me do a little rep repetition, just so uh, this will go up on uh, the interview will go up on performingartsreview.net, and then I'll follow with a review one of these days. I'm behind on reviews. Uh, That's okay. And we'll get uh, we'll, we'll get that going, but I want everyone and how, how to buy the CD and so on. But this is really a jam. I am so glad that it jumped out at me. To be honest, I saw Brahms transcription. That was it. I, 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 then I saw j piano two hands. Okay, that's that, that's it. Uh, <laughs> Pianist Uriel Tachor. Tachor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I know. Your your 2019 MS, uh, MSR Classics release, Brahms and transcription. Symphony and Hungarian Dance Piano Transcriptions by Brahms, Rager, and Kirchner, all of uh, the, the Kirchner and Rager transcriptions, all world premiere recordings, and we have discussed that, I think, at a, at a, a little bit of length, anyway, how they sound, you know, yeah. uh, uh, especially the Rager transcriptions of the, of the symphony movements, of the Brahms symphonies. Uh, absolutely superb story, superb recording, superb, superb recording, wonderful, uh, playing fabulous. Uh, I think that's about it. I'm I'm done. Many thanks. many many thanks, Uriel. I appreciate it. Many thanks to you. Thank you. See you then. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye bye.